That was very interesting. Appreciate it. Um, I mean, do I have to call you Captain? Is that, <laughs> is that your official title? Uh, fine. <laughs> yes, Captain, my Captain. So you spoke a little bit about glass in your talk. Um, and that's, that's kind of the first... And I know it's not obviously a, a finished product yet. As you mentioned, you're, you're aspiring to certain things with that. But it is sort of the first physical manifestation that many people have been able to get their hands on of things that have come mm -hmm. out of come out, a hardware product that's come out of X. So how do you think that's going so far? Like, what's your status update? I'm, I'm pleased with the progress that we're making. A lot of the progress that we're making can't even yet be seen by the public, though. It's been an adventure in learning, uh, to put it mildly. The thing that I've described that we aspire to, we're not there yet, but the explorers who have glass have been incredibly thoughtful, not only patient with glass and working through all the ways in which we are not yet at the place I described as, as aspiring to be, but also giving us really thoughtful feedback and being uh, thoughtful about how they use it in the world and sort of represent glass. It's, it's really been extraordinary. And then you mentioned how people represent it. I mean, some of the, some of the um, friction points, I guess, about glass so far have been centered upon privacy, you know, when to use it, when not to use it. Um, a lot of that has been generated off the fact that it has a camera on it. So, I mean, do you think that that criticism, the attention is unwarranted or out of balance with the way you view glass? Um, people getting thrown out of bars for using it or getting into altercations because it has a camera. Like, how do you address those privacy issues? I, I grant generally that people are uncomfortable with how fast the issues of privacy are changing in the world. But Google Glass is not going to move the needle on that subject, actually. Even though it's something of the poster child for the issue at the moment, when you go into that bar, there are hundreds and hundreds of cameras in that bar. Many of them installed by the bar, by the way, recording you while you're drinking your drink. People are holding up their phones, and they might be checking something, or they might be taking a picture of you, and they don't ask your permission, like glass explorers tend to. So I don't really buy the glass as somehow presenting the problem. I grant that generally the problem is there, but I'll give you a, a funny example. There was an article uh, that described how frightening the camera epidemic was and how it threatened society even if one didn't come into contact with an actual camera. This was in the New York Times in 1884 <laughs> when the camera came out. We got over it, and Google Glass is sort of part of that same trend, and society will wrestle with and come to terms with cameras in society generally, and Glass is neither going to set that agenda nor be responsible for it, but we are a part of it. I would actually say that microphones on your phones, microphones that are across this room, people's laptops, people have come to a set of social norms that we accept about whether they're recording and when they will retweet it or not. I don't think, and, I don't think Donald Sterling got that memo. But. <laughs> no, apparently not. Um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, that's a good point that obviously cameras are per pervasive, right? But you mentioned like the contact lens, for instance, um, with for uh, diabetes sufferers, which is an excellent, obviously, application of technology. Everybody wants people to be healthier. But what about glass? I mean, this obviously what we're looking at here, what you're wearing, and what we've seen so far are very early iterations of what glass will become. So what happens when it becomes less obvious, less out in your face, and much more unobtrusive, like putting on a pair of regular glasses, apparently, to the user or to the, uh, to the, the viewer, or uh, even a contact lens. So what happens when, when that, everyone has this layer of information? Do you think that affects privacy, privacy more negatively simply because it, there's no advertisement? You know, it doesn't say, look, I'm wearing a computer on my face. It's just I'm wearing a pair of glasses. So this is, I think, uh, I can feel good about saying this is the world's worst spy camera. If you want to surreptitiously take pictures of people, 
uh, I would not recommend glass for that use. You can use your phone. They now have a range of watches which have cameras on the side so you can look like you're looking at your watch and take a picture of people. They have things not much bigger than a grain of sand that can poke out through your buttonhole. For the foreseeable future, glass will continue to be the world's worst spy camera. Uh, I don't know what to say. If you're looking to spy on people, I can point you to some other products. <laughs> it's, just, it's not very effective for that. Probably not made by X, right? <laughs> no, but like, it's only facing in the direction that you're facing. It lights up when it's taking a picture. It, like, it would be hard for it to be worse as a spy <laughs> camera. All right, so let's reel back from glass a little bit. Um, given the, the context of what you guys do at X, do you think that risk, because companies seem to be risk adverse once they achieve a certain level of success. So you think, do you think risk is important for big companies if they want to remain innovative, they want to make sure that they don't run into the innovators dilemma and grind to a halt and just focus on iterating on an old product, for instance? I think risk is important for every company. I think it is the essence of entrepreneurship, whether you're the smallest company in the world or like Google, the second largest company in the world, to take smart risks all the time. I run this experiment frequently with groups where I give them two choices, choice A and choice B. So choice A is you get to deliver a million dollars of bottom line value to your company this year, guaranteed. Choice B, you get to deliver a billion dollars of bottom line value to your company this year, but only with one chance in 100. So everyone does the mental math. I say, who wants choice A? Nobody raises their hand. Who wants choice B? Everybody raises their hand. It's got an expected utility. It's 10 times higher than choice A. And then I say, who here believes that your boss wants you to choose choice B? And not a single person in the room raises their hand. I mean, these typically are large uh, multinationals who want to be innovative. Um, and then I say, you don't need a lecture on innovation. You need a new boss. You need a new context. I really think that it's the context that matters. We all inherently understand that taking smart risks is the right thing to do. Now, what counts as smart and what counts as a risk is different in different parts of a company or companies of different sizes. You know, you can tolerate um, a PR fiasco much easier if you're a tiny company because no one's watching you uh, than if you're a large company, for example. So the calculus is different, but the principle is still the same. The only way to stay sharp, to stay growing, to stay relevant is to take smart risks all the time. So, I mean, X, obviously, it, it, its business is sort of risk, right? There's been a, a structure put in place to allow you guys to experiment on, on a variety of things. But uh, can you tell me a little, anything about some of the practical, like, near-term stuff that has resulted from your long-term research, things that are in force like, at Google that have bled out of X? Um, I know, for instance, this morning, uh, a company called Flux, which uh, mm -hmm. does some interesting things with um, architecture and, and big data, uh, they announced they had some funding, and they were spun out of X a while ago, right? That's right. So this was one of uh, the earliest Google X projects. Uh, so we go around, we, we make it our business to try to find really big problems with the world to solve, and there's nothing in principle that we won't tackle. And so the field of construction of the built environment is the second or third largest industry in the world. It's about $7 trillion a year right now. It accounts for almost half of the world's solid waste, something like 35% of the total CO2 emissions for the planet come from building and maintaining buildings. So it is the big nut. Agriculture is the other one. So what are we going to do about it? It turns out that we would not tolerate if I came to your home and I said, tell me about the computer you'd like to buy. I'm going to interview you for six months. I'm going to spend three years kind of figuring out what would be the perfect computer for you. Then I'm going to come here. I'm actually going to have to start building the computer before we're done designing it because we don't have to wait that long. Hopefully, we'd get it right in the end. And then we probably won't. We'll have to start over a few times. So it's going to cost you 5 or $10 million for your computer, but it's going to be built just exactly right for you. We would not tolerate that, but that's what we do with buildings. So what could we do to gather together all of the learned aspects from the last several thousand years of architecture and structural engineering and allow people to prototype buildings down to the rivets, down to every last um, cent of cost and uh, watt of efficiency in the buildings in one minute? 
if they could try prototyping thousands of buildings in a few month period instead of two or three with an army of people to try to hand figure it out, these people, if you go talk to them, they do not want to draw their 10,000th bathroom. They really don't, but they end up doing it over and over again. So the mission of, of this uh, company, Flux, is to actually build a software infrastructure for supporting being able to do this, being able to reason about these buildings so that they can be iterated on much, much faster. And so it seems like, I mean, this kind of company obviously solving a very large problem. Um, you've spun it out of X, uh, and, and that is existing on its own now, and it's going to be doing whatever it does down the road. So is there a future for X as like a sort of incubator? I mean, it seems like the, the roles of X are varied. You know, you have experimentation leading the products at Google. Um, is it an incubator for companies? Like, how do you define that future? I, I hope we stay flexible at least for now because we don't know what the right answer is. I think it's possible that in the end one model will emerge as the best model, but it might not. In this particular case, what we were doing was sufficiently different from the DNA of Google. It's very enterprise oriented. It's not sort of a toothbrush model where a billion people use it twice a day kind of thing. And as a result, it made more sense to stand up as a separate company. But there are other things which we have spun back into other parts of Google. There are things that we've turned off uh, because they just weren't the right thing to keep working on. So we continue to look at, at a mix of ways that we can um, amplify these things. The thing that's not going to change is that we're focused on impact. We're focused on making the world better. And so taking a victory lap over a prototype or over a patent or over a paper published just doesn't makes sense to us. It's if we're focused on diabetes until someone's actually being monitored, we aren't done. If we're focused on saving people's lives using cars that drive themselves, until we've started saving lives, we're just not there yet. I mean, I'm excited at our progress, but it doesn't count as done till we're actually adding that value to the world that we've aspired to. And you mentioned in there that you'd like, you, some projects you just shut down, you know, like this is not working or whatever. What's How's that structure built at X? Like, how much freedom do you have? At what point does Larry or Sergey come in and be like, this is not working? You know, is it too much money? Is it too much time? Too much effort? That kind of thing. Larry and Sergey, probably more than most people, but this is true of a lot of large companies, they focus more on not letting things get fully birthed that don't make sense. Once things get birthed, it's much harder to kill them. So there's this time where they don't have a name, where there are only a small number of people, if any, who are full time on it. Lots of people are working on it, maybe. It's at that point where everyone can more intellectually and less emotionally say, this just isn't working out. You can still have spent five or 10 man years on the work over a one year period. But that point where you say, nope, it's just, there isn't enough of a there there is much less emotional than later when it has a name and there are 50 people working on it. And you know, once you've told the public that you're working on it, each of those things kind of ups the ante and makes turning it off more painful. So we try to have our failures as early as possible and, and we turn off 100 things a year easily that, that have, a concept that we think, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a jet pack that wasn't a death trap? And we work and we work and we work and no, sorry. I'm I mean, really sad to hear you say no, no I know. a jet pack. But. Actually, it turns out you can make a jet pack that's not a death trap. The problem isn't that. The real problem is that it was going to be so power inefficient, it was going to get like a fourth of a mile to the gallon. I just I couldn't live with that. And it was going to be probably about as loud as a motorcycle. And I didn't think other people were going to be okay I with can, that. I can deal with both of those. I'm, I'm you okay. can. I'm <laughs> not sure society's going to be cool when you zoom over people's houses. And we thought, for now, those are showstoppers. Just use that as an example. Right, right. Gotcha. Um, I mean, X is obviously a privately funded effort. You know, Google puts money into it and you guys get to, get to do things and you get a relative freedom to do that. But there are some comparisons between that and like past organizations like uh, DARPA or Bell Labs, you know, places where people are kind of given a little freedom to just think about things and then maybe something comes out of that. Maybe something comes out of it that doesn't really work or whatever the case may be. So aside from eventually creating products that do create a, a 10x change, but also some benefit to Google or become their own company, like, are there any plans to export your 
your way of doing things, like as a template or a model for other companies that have labs of their own or other companies that are starting up, like the methodologies, ways it can be emulated by others? Absolutely. Uh, first, that's why I'm here. That's why I do these sort of things. There is a lot of the things that we're building at X that we can't yet talk about, and it's very frustrating to me. I'm a sherry kind of guy. So talking about our ethos and why we do things and how we do things, not just to like, you know, pat ourselves on the back with both hands, but to try to encourage other people to do something similar is part of our mission at X. I hope that we can get moonshot thinking, sort of aspirational 10X, how are we gonna make the world radically better, radically fast kind of thinking out into the world. So one of the things that we do is we run a, an event called Solve for X. If you guys haven't visited, solveforx.com. And at solveforx.com, there are now on the order of 300 moonshot proposals, almost none of them by us that we sort of lightly curate, but we're encouraging the world to think about what a moonshot could be, the right sort of framework for a moonshot, and we have a proposal for what we think that is, and then asking people to put up their own ideas or to celebrate other people's ideas. And so this is an example of us trying to sort of amplify our ethos and get other people to play with us. And that's um, the, the use of ethos thing. So like, if you wouldn't mind, do you have a problem that came up in, in you know, developing anything? It doesn't really matter what the project is. It's more about like, exemplifying how you guys think about things. Do you have a problem that came up that you can describe how the team solved it? Like a specific thing, something drilled down a little bit. Um, all right, well, I'll give you two, the first two things that came to mind. I'm not sure if they're exactly what you're looking for. So one, just to understand, because really this is not like I invented moonshot thinking and that's not how it works. It's actually Larry and Sergey who come hardwired this way and they've made it possible for us at Google X to be like this. So there was this moment we'd been working on Project Loon. This is the stratospheric balloon project covering um, the world with balloons that are like floating cell towers so that everyone in the world could have internet connectivity. And maybe about a year ago, we went to him, this was just before we launched, and we had worked for six months to um, make a deal to buy some harmonized spectrum. And we thought this was just gonna be absolutely critical to the project and we wanted to get it done before we launched and easily four, 600 man hours of really heavy lifting and arguing with these large companies. And we went to Larry and Larry said, nah, you're gonna hit a double. That's not interesting. Go, you're gonna be really frustrated. You'll be angry at me for a week, but then you're gonna get creative. You'll come up with a home run. And he sent us away and we were like, for about a week afterwards. And then, you know, we were gonna kill the project or come up with something and we didn't feel like it was time to kill the project. So we're like, okay, let's sharpen our pencils. And in fact, we did come up with something that's way better than buying a relatively thin piece of harmonized spectrum. That's now the way that, that Google Loon is going to function basically by using the spectrum that already exists um, in each country, and so then, you know, so if, if you're a telco in some country, I come to you and I say, you're just gonna lease the balloons when they pass over Argentina. It's your spectrum, we're not even gonna license it. It's, you already have the spectrum. And that actually makes you feel much more comfortable that I'm not invading your country or I'm about to take your users, so now you and I can be great friends, and we don't even need to buy the spectrum, and we have a much a thicker wedge, which means much more bandwidth. So that's an example from the top where the problem was actually presented by Larry in this case. But I'll give you another example. We have a bunch of projects that care a lot about where specifically you are. Some of them, like Project Loon, has no interference. It's way up in the sky, so they can see the satellites very easily. But some, like the, the self-driving cars or like Google Glass, are right in the middle of buildings. Even when you're outside, uh, you have what's called the GPS multipath problem. So the satellite sends you a signal, and maybe if you're lucky it hits you directly, but it also bounces off buildings, sometimes multiple times and then hits you. And that causes timing delays 
And so the GPS um, chip is confused about exactly how far away the satellite is, what direction it, it, it is, and that uh, makes your estimate of where you are worse. And so someone said recently, I would just overheard this conversation. Instead of seeing this as a problem, why don't we just make this an opportunity? We already have physical models of all the large uh, cities in the world, why don't we just see this as an inverse ray tracing problem and actually compute based on where approximately we are all of the multipath from GPS and we'll not only be able to back out the error that that's causing, we'll actually be able to localize much better. Now, that isn't done, I just overheard this like a week ago, <laughs> but that's an awesome example of people taking a problem and turning it into an opportunity. Cool, thanks very much. And, and uh, to just sum up, uh, I'll ask you just a very brief question, which is, if you had, you personally, not X, but you personally, if you had one problem that just frustrated you so much that you want to turn your team loose on solving it, what would it be? Oh, I hate choosing. <laughs> top two, I'll give you top two. <laughs> um, I think, my favorite two, agriculture really uh, worries me. It is the largest industry in the world. It is the most inefficient industry in the world. It's the cause of um, a lot of our solid waste and carbon emission problems. There's so much opportunity there, so much opportunity. Just a trivial example, something like 10% of all of the supposedly arable land is not actually arable because it's on a slope. Like, we can do better than that, guys. Like, a slope like that should not cause us not to farm. But it does. There, there's hundreds of things like that in agriculture. So that would be one area I would definitely go after. Another one is batteries. I think that a 10x improvement in energy density, either gravimetric, sort of energy per kilogram, or volumetric, energy per cubic meter of battery. A 10x improvement in that would change the world so radically we can't even see to where that would be. There would be things like electric airplanes, for example, but I think that would be the tip of the iceberg. I think uh, that would radically change how we think about energy and how we live our lives. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm all for the battery improvement, so get, get working on that ASAP. All right, thank you <laughs> very do. much. Thank I you, Matt. It. Thank you.